All right. Hi, everyone. We are live. Welcome to Market Matters. My name is Katie Kuntz, and I'm a social media editor here at CNBC. I'm joined by our senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani, and today we're going to be answering all of your questions about the latest market moves. Nice to see you, Bob. Hello, Katie. How's the weather in Los Angeles? Oh, it's sunny out here today. It's beautiful. How about on the East Coast? Uh, don't even get, don't get me started. It's been miserable. The sun has not been out for probably two weeks in in uh, New York. And this is the kind of, the time of year, very beginning of February, when everyone's basically fed up with the weather and want to get out. This is when people start thinking about Florida or mm -hmm. being vacation for, you know, long weekends or a week off if you can afford it. Um, it's that time of year. And basically all you got to do is just sort of live through it. Everybody who lives in the Northeast knows that this is, you know, that time of year where you get kind of fed up with everything and you start thinking about spring, but spring is a couple months away. So, right. Yep. It's definitely, you know, early February, it's that time of year. So hopefully you're able to escape and get some sun sometime soon. Um, but a lot going on with the stock market, Bob. So let's just jump right into it. Um, first up, how is earnings season going so far? We've gotten well, a lot of reports recently. Yeah, a lot of the tech stocks have been out, and generally the numbers are pretty good. You you can get very caught up in little micro data, like you know, is Apple's sales in China decreasing? Uh, and there is a certain importance to all of this on a micro level, but the trend for earnings are very strong, particularly in technology. In fact, the, for the fourth quarter estimates, we're in the middle of finishing the fourth quarter, uh, we're expected to be about 7% higher. That was a lot higher than a few weeks ago when it was only 4.5%. It's mostly technology stocks that are coming in very strong. Uh, don't worry too much if a stock drops a little bit. Generally, even Microsoft's numbers and Apple's numbers have been fine. A lot of these things have very high expectations embedded in them. People drive up the prices hoping they're going to say even better things. And if they don't, they sell off. But the numbers they report are still really good. So Apple is very simple to understand. About 60% of the revenues are iPhone. Um, that's huge. I mean, they're launching, yes, this you know, uh, this new uh, three-dimensional uh, re reality you know, headset. Uh, that's a little amusing to look at. But that's not a significant part of sales of anything. It's the iPhone that matters. And after that, it's services. And both of them are doing very, very well, considering, you know, these phones are expensive. So um, elsewhere, you can find things to worry about. So I'll give you an example. Some companies are reporting that sell things, real things, um, lower volumes. Um, uh, and because of deflation, um, prices can't go up as much. So Sherwin-Williams, the paint company, they were seeing lower input costs. So the, the, co the physical cost of producing the paint, commodity costs for producing the paints, resin, were going down. That's good, right? Because they were driving the prices up because the cost of the resins to make the paints were going up. Well, now the pro costs are going down. But the company comes out and said, well, that's true. The costs are going down. But wages are higher. We're having to pay more money to the employees. So it's offsetting that. And as a result, Sherwin-Williams announced price increases, not decreases for the price of their paint. Well, that's not helpful. You know, we're, it's good. You'd, you'd hope like deflation would lead to lower prices. There's a problem for these companies. If, if you have lower volumes and, you know, the do-it-yourself market, that's the Sherman ones. They, they're they been a little bit under pressure because there were so many people who fixed up their homes during COVID that the, the paint demand is a little bit lower than it was a couple of years ago, but still pretty good. But you have companies reporting lower volumes, and um, if you have lower prices, that's a real problem. That pressures your margin. So companies don't really want to lower prices. I don't care what they say. Um, it's a problem for them. Higher prices, not only to cover costs, but to cover some profit if they can get away with it. Yeah, that's a good thing. When you have lower volumes and lower prices, that's a problem. So keep an eye on that uh, this year. Companies generally want to you know, at least keep prices in line with the rate of inflation. Uh, so I would say generally the earnings season is is pretty good still. And there's a reason the S&P 500 is at a new high. The S&P 500 is the collective pricing of the 500 largest stocks in the United States. It's at an historic high largely because 
Earnings are coming in pretty well. And technology, the, 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 the big story is artificial intelligence is driving profits at a small group of technology companies. And you might say to yourself, well, that's not good. A small group are driving a large part of the profits. That's true, but I got news for you. This has always been true. There is all, most of the time, a small group of companies drive the overall profits. That's why you don't want to pick stocks, why it's so difficult to do that, to pick the winners and losers long term, because collectively, the United States economy generates money, generates profit. But individually, on company levels, there are winners and losers all the time. And generally, there are long term, there's a few big winners, and most other companies kind of putter along, and a number of them sputter out altogether. There's a lot of companies at the lower rung of the S&P 500 that frankly haven't done anything for years. They haven't increased their profits. They're just sputtering along, you know, putting out a certain amount of profits. Uh, if they don't, eventually they go out of business. But you could have a small amount of profits for years, not do anything. As long as you have, for example, a dividend base, put out dividends, you can sputter along. But real growth is in a few companies. That's why you see Microsoft. And Apple and NVIDIA, which has captured the chips that make a lot of the artificial intelligence systems going. That's why it happens. So the, the market, this is why indexing wins out, because you don't make a bet on who's going to win and lose. You just bet on the direction of corporate America and assume that everyone's going to figure out who the winners and losers are. And you're going to participate that if you own the S&P 500. And you're just there. You don't have to figure the whole thing out. You're just going along for the ride. Right now, the S&P 500 is up about 2% year to date. On an average year, the S&P will go up about 8%, 7% with a 2% dividend. So typical year, 8 9 10% increase in the S&P. That's all you need to know. For 75, for 100 years, since the late 1920s, the S&P 500 has been up 75% of the time year over year. That fact alone should tell you that if you hold on long term, you make money. And if you reinvest the dividends, you make more. We can talk about the dividends in a minute. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but it's something I feel very passionately about. So I follow all these companies. I watch Sherwin-Williams, but uh, would I tell you to go buy Sherwin-Williams now based on some? No, you're free to do so. Professionals do all the time. But you should know it's really hard to pick the winners and losers. Well, let's talk about Meta, Bob, um, which announced its first ever dividend. Um, what do investors need to know about Meta? Yeah, so, so Meta never Meta was a typical tech stock. It never paid a dividend. There are some tech stocks that have been paying dividend for a while. The two ex examples are Apple uh, and Microsoft. They pay very small dividends, but it's they do pay a dividend. So Meta announced uh, 50 cents a uh, on a quarterly rate. So that's $2. And that's about a, a yield of about $2 a year. That's a yield of about a half a percent. That's not a lot. The S&P 500 pays average yield for the S&P 500 is about 1.5, 1.6%. Um, and you can get much higher, 3 4% owning AT&T or Verizon. Um, but while the yield is small, you know, the company's big. So even 0.5%, you know, even $2 a year, that's about four and a half billion dollars that they're paying out to shareholders they never paid before. Believe it or not, that's a lot of money. I mean, the biggest payout person, the company pays the biggest amount of money is Microsoft. They pay about $22 billion a year in dividends. Even though they have like an 0.8% yield, 22 billion. Well, 4.4 billion from Meta may not sound much against Microsoft, but you know what? They're the 31st biggest dividend payer. Just by making this announcement, they became the 31st biggest one. Um, uh, uh, I'll give you an idea. Visa pays about the same amount, four and a half billion. So th and this is money that goes into your pocket. You know, even 0.5%. You know, you own one share of Meta, you get two dollars a year. They just send it to you. And this is a very good example uh, of why people like dividends because it's cash in your in your pocket that you get. You're not just holding on to a stock. You're actually getting some money from the company. Uh, about 80% of the S&P 500 pay a dividend. And that's why, because people want something other than the hope for 
future price increases. They want cash in hand. Now, don't delude yourself. It's not free money. You know, the you can't create money out of nothing. The stock price will adjust for the fact that the company just gave you, you know, 50 cents a quarter. Uh, but a lot of people like that money in hand. And when you reinvest the money, that's when uh, real worth is created um, long term. That, that's how you make uh, uh, real money. Uh, and what happens, and I know this sounds boring, but if you take a, 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 you know, a 2% dividend yield a year and reinvest it, that's the source of most real wealth because you have compounding interest. By the way, this is what I do. People ask me what I, I, I own this. I own the S&P 500. I wrote a book about this and it's in my book, what exactly I own, but I reinvest the dividends. So 2% sounds like boring. People say to me, what do I care about a 2% dividend? I want to make 100% owning Microsoft. Well, good luck picking that one. All I can tell you is you be boring. Take the S&P 500, invest 2% a year, get your 2%, put it back in. And it's the reinvested dividends that make the money over time. Because after one year, it doesn't sound like much. But after 30 years, well, trust me, I do this. It's a lot. It's enough for you to quietly, if you're prudent, retire and live off the dividends. You can do that. And that's the beauty of compounding interest. It doesn't look much in the first year, but if you take 2% of pick a number, $1,000 and take a, keep buying $1,000 every year and taking the 2% dividend and reinvest it, do it over 30 years. Do a simple calculator on Google and look at the money. It doesn't look like anything in first year, second year. Go to the 20th year and the 30th year, and you're compounding on compounding on compounding, and the numbers get really big after 30 years. And that's the secret to the game. You become a person who makes money off of money. The French have a great word for this, rentier. Rentier is somebody who used to have properties years ago, and they would make money just by people giving them money for the properties. It implied somebody who didn't really work for a living. They just rented out money and got money for it. Rentier, look it up, it's a great word. That's essentially what you are. And that's the beauty of the capitalist system. You can lend people money. You are essentially buying into a company, giving them hopes for future returns and a little dividend, and you're reinvesting the money. So I've said this many, many times, but I am telling you it is the source of great wealth for a lot of people who don't want to sit around trying to figure out whether they should buy and sell certain stocks. And even with that, certainty, they're still not necessarily going to make any money. Here's a way to make money, simply long-term. So Bob, um, kind of going off of that, um, let's talk about the Magnificent Seven stocks as a whole. Are they overvalued? Well, you know, I don't do anything like stock recommendations, but you can, a simple way to look at these kinds of stocks is how far have they gotten, has the earnings expectations gotten from the price? So. This is a kind of crude way to look at things, but the P.E. ratio is very, really very useful. So you have a price for a stock, but what are you getting when you get a stock? H historically, it's very clear what you get when you get a stock. You get a future stream of earnings, expectations, or a dividend, some payout. Now, some companies now pay do buybacks and give money back in that way, but historically, you would you are buying a future stream of dividends and and earnings out there and the question then becomes how much are you going to pay for this future stream of earnings so suppose you have xyz stock and it's uh it's a hundred dollars and you think they're going to make uh ten dollars in the next year plus pay a dollar dividend so, you know, you have $10 in earnings and a dollar in dividend, and so there you got $11. And so you, the, the, what you're paying for this future stream of earnings plus the dividends is $100 divided by 11. You know, that's a close to $10, uh, 10 times the earnings and the dividend. You can figure this out different ways. Traditionally, they leave the, because dividends tend to be a smaller amount of the earnings, they leave it out. They just say the P-E ratio. 
So you got a hundred dollar stock. They think it's going to pay ten dollars and did ten dollars in earnings. Hundred divided by ten, the PE ratio we call it the multiple is ten. Okay, so is that worth it? Is it worth paying hundred dollars for that ten dollars in future earnings? Well, that's the debate that Wall Street has all day long. Now, what happens if all of a sudden the earnings go to eight dollars? Well, now you have a multiple of 12, 100 divided by eight, 12 and a half, actually. Is that worth it? Eh, it might not be. That price might have to come down to say, you know, $80. Because if you take $80 divided by $8, you get 10. The multiple is the same. So people debate, are these prices worth it? So here's what I can tell you. The big name here, NVIDIA, it, the price has gone up dramatically in the last couple of years. You see this, several hundred percent. Yet the earnings have also gone up. So NVIDIA is a high multiple stock. It's 50 times forward earnings. That's a lot. I mean, that's high, but not for NVIDIA. The, the S&P 500 on average is about 17 times forward. Or forward earnings mean the following forward months. So right now we're all looking at the earnings for 2024. And typically the S&P 500 is about 17 times forward. Tech stocks are higher. They're in often 20 or so. NVIDIA is 50, but it's not gone up dramatically because even though it's high priced because the earnings have gone up. Apple is the same thing. Apple's traditionally been 25, 26, 27 times forward earnings. That's about where it is right now. There are periods where this can get very pricey and people will say that will come on our air. Oh, well, it's overpriced. They're talking about the forward earnings expectations. Microsoft has been in, uh, I guess, in the 30s of uh, for a long time, I, I don't know where it is now, maybe 34, or 5, 6. Um, that's probably the higher end of the recent range. So some people could argue it is. Tesla is a very strange example, kind of doesn't play by anybody rules. Uh, it's been traditionally very, very expensive always because uh, Tesla is really a play on a man, on Elon Musk. And it's very strange. Most companies are not a play on a single individual. They just aren't. Most companies are collective. Um, Tesla's different. Uh, so Tesla's price is down a lot this month. The forward earnings are, I don't know, 50 or something. The multiple's like 50. But I wouldn't use that as an expe expectation. So the, the answer to this question is it depends on how you look at it. On a purely, purely... PE basis, I wouldn't say they are dramatically overvalued. I would say they are very crowded trade, and you see what happens. Microsoft had a perfectly good report, and yet the stock fluttered a lot because people, the stocks are priced to perfection. If anything, you know, people on every little line, and they find things they don't like, and they start writing about it, and so that's what makes a market, essentially. So I'm not giving you a clear answer about whether they're overvalued. I'm giving you a range here of ideas. And um, what you want to be careful about is investing a little too much of your money in that kind of game, necessarily. AI, the thing that you have to think of is paradigms. AI is a paradigm changing event. This is similar to what happened with the Internet in the 1990s. It spawned an entire generation of companies, including Amazon. Uh, that didn't exist before, that suddenly could sell shit online. What an idea. We take this so much for granted, but I don't know how many people are watching. Remember, uh, there was no internet when we started CNBC in 1989, 1990. Well, there was some early forms, but the Netscape, Netscape, the browser came out August 95, I believe. I remember that. And we, <laughs> we didn't have cell phones when we started CNBC. We didn't, we didn't have an internet. I know that sounds ridiculous, but we didn't. And it changed the world, the internet. AI is helping to change the world too, and hopefully for the better. And so this paradigm event, this ch paradigm changing event is causing a lot of excitement and a lot of overcrowding. I wouldn't worry about it uh, that much. There's a lot of people wringing their hands saying these small number of stocks have too much influence on the S&P. Uh, the S&P will correct pretty quickly if it does, uh, and I wouldn't worry about that. And it, it, I see no reason for anybody to sell the S&P 500 on that worry. So, Bob, let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about the Fed. Um, what did we learn from this week's Fed decision? 
Well, we learned that, uh, first off, if you look at the jobs report today, Powell was right. Jay Powell, the, the head of the Fed, doesn't want to be put in a corner. He wants what they call strategic ambiguity. What does that mean? What the market wants, market's like a child. It always wants something. And sometimes it wants two things at once that don't make any sense. So the market wants to have its cake and eat it too. What does the stock market want? They want the economy to be strong. They want jobs to be strong. That's nice. But they also want the Fed to cut rates. Well, here's the problem. Generally, the Federal Reserve doesn't cut rates unless the economy is weak. How are they going to do this? Oh, the economy is great. Oh, by the way, we're cutting rates. That doesn't make that much sense. And the market is acting like they think the Federal Reserve is going to imminently start cutting interest rates. And the, the bets were in March. And the problem is the economy is not weak enough for them to do that. Today's job report was tremendous. Now, everybody, the market went down today. This is how this idiocy in the stock market, uh, because they realized that the economy was so strong, the Fed's not going to cut interest rates imminently. They're not going to cut rates in March. The probability is pretty damn small, unless something really awful happens in the economic news between now and March. They're not going to do that. But the stock market have been hoping they were going to get five or six rate cuts beginning in March this year. Well, I told you, they're like a child. So Powell on Wednesday had to say, kiddies, listen to me. We are trying to get inflation down and we're getting inflation down. It's moving in the right direction. We're happy with the trend, but we're not where we need to be yet. Therefore, you know, without coming out and saying we're not cutting rates in March, he didn't say that. He, he simply said, we're not where we need to be yet. We don't have the confidence to begin cutting interest rate. So he didn't give any timeline, but he just said, kiddies, listen, daddy's telling you. And everybody said, oh, crap. And the market went down a little bit, not dramatically. So the question is, can the stock market withstand what's going on? Can the stock market withstand less interest rate cuts in exchange for a strong economy. And look at the stock market. Just You don't even have to think too hard. Just look at the S&P 500 generically. And if you want, look at the sectors. It's held up pretty well. It's taken the news pretty well. It dropped a little bit. So the stock market is like a child. The stock market, daddy, reminds children, you're not making sense. Listen to me. Sit down and think of what you're doing. Kid sits down, sulks a little thinks about it, and it just goes on with his life. I know I'm not going to stretch the child metaphor too far, but it really is like this. I've been watching the stock market for 30 years, and that's the way it behaves. So I am not terribly concerned. If you want my opinion, I'd rather have a strong economy. I want people with jobs. I want people with plenty of jobs and the chances to go twitch around. I want more money in the average working man's pocket. By the way, wage growth is still pretty strong. And you can say, well, that's not good for inflation. And you're right. But I'd rather have all that and, you know, have interest rates be a little higher. I think the weird thing that's happened was what happened, you know, in the last 10 years. We had 10-year interest rates at 1%. What idiot is going to give the federal, is going to give the government of the United States money for 10 years at 1%? That doesn't make any sense. That's not a normal interest rate. It's what we've had recently. 2%, 3% mortgages for 30 years. That's not normal. It wasn't never like that. Our interest mortgage rates in the in the 5% range or 6% range in December, that, that's a lot more normal, which is where we are now, than it was five years ago. I know everybody thinks, oh, we're going to have cheap credit for the rest of your life. But, you know, it's not normal to have these kinds of rates. So a 10-year yield at 4% is much more normal. This is a better environment. My mother is saving money by putting in the one-year CDs. I made fun of her all year last year about this. My mother was right, very beginning. She pulled her money out when the when the rates went up. All of a sudden, she was getting 4.5% on her one-year CDs. My mother, my 95-year-old mother figured this out. So I think this environment is, is good right now. And I don't, if the Fed doesn't cut rates until later in the year, I'm fine with that. I'd rather have a strong economy 
uh, anyhow. And uh, look at the jobs report today. Boy, it's, it's really something. All right, Bob, and our last question for today is about the IPO market. Um, what are the expectations for IPOs in 2024? Well, unfortunately, you know, you'd think the most important thing for IPOs is a strong stock market and interest rates that are flat to trending down. And that's what we have. So you'd think, gosh, the IPO market must be great, but it's kind of off to a tough smart we start. We had a couple of names this week, uh, Bright Spring Price last week, that was uh, those um, uh, healthcare units, uh, it didn't do that well. Amher Sports Price this week below the range. Amher's a big name. They are a big global company. They used to own the, the old Wilson Sporting Goods and Arcteryx. That's a big outdoor uh, sporting uh, uh, company, uh, uh, outerwear. Very famous. Uh, great stuff. Iconic brand names. Um, but they price below the range. The price talk. And I think there's a lot of people pushing back on the valuations. Uh, companies had very high valuations, particularly tech stocks during COVID. Uh, they got rounds of funding in the private market. And suddenly they thought they could go higher. And there's a lot of pushback. So I think Wall Street is mispricing the sentiment for IPOs. The good news is this. Lower prices is good. Remember, folks, it's buy low, sell high. So if you're a CNBC viewer and you have a IPO that's priced below the range, that doesn't mean the, the company's a loser. It means that Wall Street mispriced the IPO. You have a chance to buy it lower. That's good news. I vote yes for that. Buy low, sell high, right? Okay, that's what you want. So the the uh, I'm in favor of how that happened, uh, of all that happening. Now, the problem is the companies may or may not decide, oh, crap, I'm taking a haircut. I'm going to make less money. That's what it is they call it a haircut. I may not want to do it. So there's companies out there like Reddit, you know, the social media platform. They've been sitting out there for two years trying to figure out if they can go public. Now they're talking about doing it. And they look at this and they say, well, all right, maybe we won't get as much money as we thought. They have to decide whether it's worth it. There's a whole bunch of these companies out there. Um, Del Monte, remember them? The canned fruit company. They've been going back and forth about going public again. Uh, Panera Bread, the restaurant chain, they're out there. Um, Seat Geek, this is like an online ticket marketplace, like a, a competitor to Ticketmaster. They're thinking of going public. We've been talking about Sheen on the air, that, that, this Chinese fast fashion. You know, they compete against uh, Uniqlo, um, for example. Uh, there's other ones out there. Um, Databricks, this is a big um, uh, cloud analytics firm. So they're all trying to figure out if they want to go, <coughs> if they want to go public or not. And I generally think a lot of them are going to have to take haircuts, but this is a pretty good environment to go public by and large. There's a lot of AI hopefuls out there. It's big AI stories too. Uh, there's another one, Rubric. This is a cloud management, data management system. They're backed by Microsoft. <clears throat> They're looking out, out there too. So I'm optimistic, even though people are pushing back against high valuations, good for them. Let, let's Let's price these things a little lower, and that'll increase the chances they make long term. What an idea. Well, we'll definitely have to wait and see what happens uh, later on this year, Bob, with all of those companies. Um, but thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions. And we'll talk again in a couple weeks. Thanks, guys. Good talking to you.